Faith. With you, you are. <laughs> yes, I am. Both of our hearts. Yes. Uh, Tonight I have a couple old friends uh, who uh, I've just wanted to hear publicly for a long time in, in this sort of context. Uh, Mary Rose O'Reilly and Tom Garvey. And we'll kind of take this conversation wherever it goes. Um, but uh, let me start by asking them to introduce themselves. Uh, Mary Rose, would you mind starting? Hi, Peter. Hi. I'm Mary Rose O'Reilly, and I'm a teacher and a writer and a mom. I have two grown children, as moms always want to say. And I've spent the last few years not working. I've been on a grant and on a sabbatical, and I've been traveling a lot in England and staying in a Buddhist community in France and working as a pastor in a small church in Maine, so I've been out of my element for a while. And I have nothing big to say. That was, that was the requirement for this evening. I, said, I, wanted, a, I wanted a session. Af after all these people with hobby horses, I wanted a session with the people who had nothing to say but lots to talk about. Um, hmm. Okay, well, th there's some other things I'd like to get into in your biography later, but let's we'll, we'll leave it at that for now. Tom. Good evening, Peter. I'm Tom Garvey. Um, I'm a uh, pastor priest in the Roman Catholic Church, have been for 39 years, we're into our 40th year as our classes as priests of this diocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis area. <clears throat> One of my um, claims to fame, I guess, is that I met Mary Rose O'Reilly in 1957 in the first parish that I was in. I met Mary Rose and her family and all those other people in that neighborhood. I've been pastoring in the Twin City area for all that time since and uh, enjoying it immensely and finding it a um, an occupation, a profession that uh, has taken a great deal of energy and has challenged me and I've enjoyed doing so much. I retired two years ago. When I hit 65, I said, that's it for full-time ministry. I want to do some other things. And that's currently what I'm trying to figure out what to do. In two years of my, <clears throat> last two years of my life, I've been trying to figure out all that. So maybe we can talk about that further as we go. That does lead into what I was identifying as the, the place to start the ball rolling. Uh, this, the, the whole matter of life stages maybe, of places people come to in, in life at which various kinds of decisions need to be made or com recommitments need to be made or changes need to be made. And uh, I have a sense that from talking to you both that, at ver that in various ways uh, s s there's some shifting, maybe not great new crises and decisions and all that sort of stuff that would give someone really something to say, but kind of shifting of the ground or shifting of the tectonic plates underneath the ground or something like that. And I guess I'd be interested in, in just hearing whatever you had to say about what you see, of, what you think about your stage of life right now and the, the way in which the ground is remaining firm, shifting, whatever whatever comes to mind. image of shifting the tectonic plates is very vivid for me because that's what it feels like when I feel called in a way to make a change. <coughs> it feels like there's just a, you know, just rather uncomfortable inner feeling of, of motion and um, just being driven out of myself into some new place that I have to go. It's really not almost a, a thinking, well, it'd be nice to make a change. It's just, a, oh my goodness, I just must do something very different with my life. And those uh, moments have been always very clear to me. Are you, are you saying the issue, I, I, the one I identify is with it, identify with is that there seems to be a need to do something different with your life. Is that what you're saying? Other, maybe not so much different. Uh, um, uh -huh. I mean, it starts for me with a feeling of just real uh, anxiety that I can't necessarily put a name to. And I, I don't, you know, go through my life with enormous anxiety. But I think at four or five really major junk 
junctures in my life. I've felt that I've just woken up one morning and um, the wind has changed and there's some new place that I need to be and go. And they've always been very odd changes, and, but mm -hmm. very clear, very authoritative. Less with stages of life and children moving out and so on, m what we think of as major life shifts as just some day in May, I knew I had to do something different. I identify with that a lot. I, I think there's, there are a couple energies involved. One is this underneath the plate shift that happens. The other is in me an enormous restlessness uh -huh. that I have to recognize and I think deal with but I feel the restlessness so often and there's uh, there's a lot of the old tapes that play the shoulds that I keep hearing that I need to do something with that I need to pay some attention to either to ignore them or to kind of go with them but I get the sense often of, of a, a deeper drive, I don't know if it's vocation in calling that's just part of the whole genetic makeup of a person of an myself. Irish Catholic. Of an Irish <laughs> of an Irish Catholic, yes. <laughs> Clergy, even worse. Uh, my father's son, perhaps, to compound the problem, to get that Irishness into it too. And um, <clears throat> so I feel that drive and then comes my own personal stamp on, on this retirement business that says I've got to do something, I've got to make sense, make I've got sense. to connect with the world well. Pastoring was easy to do. Um, when I'm not pastoring it's much more difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I find myself being kind of drawn back to doing some little pastorette kind of work, you know, weekend work, that kind of thing. that isn't quite fulfilling my, um, not answering my needs terribly much. So, so one thing that kind of drives a, a, a desire for change is a sense that the sort of you do, thing you're doing right now is in some sense too easy? Or well, what, dr kind of what drives my, my um, whatever motion I'm in now, what drives it is that I can't help it. Both, I think it just, it's something deep and internal in me. It's also something that I've learned, a restlessness and dissatisfaction with the way things are with me, uh, having to be doing something. When people ask me, oh, you're retired, that's wonderful. What are you doing? I get so <laughs> defensive because I think I have to lay out for people a whole list of very exciting things. And then they say, are you traveling? Oh. And I say, well, no, I'm not traveling particularly much. Um, that'd be a part of it, I suppose, but I'm not terribly interested in doing that. I'm enjoying being right where I am. I like being out of the work that I was doing full time. And I am intrigued and challenged by being in a position where I can name my day and name the kind of tasks that I do. Think about uh, something Simone Weil said that's always been a kind of both important to me and also a great puzzle. She said she I knew we were going to come up. Well, Good. well, well, Not to Simone Weil. Uh, well, <laughs> well, I don't. You know, we don't. We don't just drag philosophers in promiscuously on this show. But if they fit, we don't exclude them. We don't have a fence around them either. Uh, Simone Weil, a, a very great Catholic philosopher of the century, who said that. Um, a sort of Jewish philosopher at the edge of the Catholic Church, actually, who said that her desire was to live always by necessity. That she wanted, the, the kind of life she wanted was a life in which everything she did was in some sense necessary. And this is, you know, she had this tenden tendency to drop sentences like that without context, without explanation, without, certainly without argument, and just let you go figure them out. But I, I've, that's one I've been kind of thinking about and puzzling about for a good long time. I'm wondering, does it make sense? The rest sense? of us have to try to live by that. Yeah, well, right. Or, <laughs> the authority, and it's like reading well, and we've got to do it. Well, I think she had this sense. I mean, more than a lot of people, I have a sense that she, she was uh, sort of writing, at least in the spirit of Scripture. But I think that may be just being a French philosopher. Well, so certainly. the line again was, every it, one of us 
Well, she said that she personally uh, aspired to always live by necessity, to have, no, to have nothing in her life that wasn't in some sense necessary. And, I mean, in what sense, of course, is the big problem. But does that resonate at all? I mean, I, I, I mean or, or does it seem kind of crazy? Well, Simone is typically kind of crazy. Yeah, right. <laughs> typically kind of crazy. The word that resonates for me, and I suppose we all have our private vocabulary of words that kind of shine for us, but the word that comes to me is not necessity, but desire. Desire is a very non-Buddhist word. You know, I spent six months in a, or six weeks in a Buddhist community, and I kept being told to, to uh, repress. It's not a Buddhist word either, but become free of desire. And at the end of that period, I realized that desire is the most significant and important um, drawing force in my life. I think of um, it's a sentence in the Cloud of Unknowing that says something like. Uh, God has awakened our desire, and, and this is the phrase I love, fastened us to a leash of longing. Fastened us to a leash of mm, longing. Like that. That's very nice. <laughs> yes, and what I feel very much <coughs> led by is this leash of longing, you know, and it's, and it's my desire, my longing, my, uh, my love, I think, that drives me forward. Mm. That's how I put it. And I don't understand what she means by necessity. I never have quite either. And uh, I, uh, parts of it resonate with me, too. There's a kind of a necessity built into my life from what I've done and what I've studied and all of that that I think is, is important. But I see it as a, uh, I think maybe a necessity within and a necessity without. Uh, I think the world needs some wisdom. And so I have a necessity, I think, to do my own little bit to try to get some kind of voice working but drawn by the leash of longing. Isn't that beautiful? You know what resonates with me on that? <clears throat> I was on sabbatical once in California at the University of Santa Cruz, and I happened upon a poet by the name of William Everson. He used to be Brother Antoninus, a Dominican poet. Do you remember? Yes, I know his work. I've seen him read. Have you? Yes. Yeah. Uh, at Gosh, at Notre Dame, very uh -huh. long ago. Okay. Well, I had the privilege of sitting at his feet for one quarter at that glorious university. And um, he moved me so much, and we became really quite good friends, I think. It, um, I used to visit him every year when I go out to California. I'd drive out to his place and go up into his mountain cabin where he lived, he and his wife and son. And um, we became people that I think, at least I thought about him a lot. But his... Um, his class was called um, something like the mystery of vocation, mm -hmm. of calling, and I think of longing mm -hmm. being something the same. What he was saying is that we have a vocation, all of us. This is now a sort of stereotypical class given to students at the University of Santa Cruz, which is um, overlooking the ocean in this glorious setting, and we are listening to this man talk about vocation. And um, he, he described vocation as being an inner call to people to find the place and the work, but mostly the place hmm. in life where I can most be myself. And um, he was saying it's more than job, it's more than task, it's more than whether you are a poet, it's more than whether you are a priest or philosopher or mother or whatever. It's just It goes much deeper than that. And it's a place where God's longing for me and my longing for God come together. Uh, God understood very, very broadly. And uh, environmental God, uh, God of person, of place. And it's that place where the person begins to perceive the real vocation of life. And that's been um, <clears throat> 15 years ago, I think, when I first met the man and started listening to him. And I have been both healed and bothered by that since. Healed and bothered is yeah. a wonderful phrase. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's um, that, it's that been something it. that I have been, it's been very much a part of me since. Well, 
I mean, I, I, one one thing about about Simone's line that that I'm I'm real conscious of is that whatever she means by necessity, it's in some kind of contrast to the experience you have when you wake up in the morning and think, what do I do today with a kind of clean slate, with a kind of sense of anything's possible. Uh, they used to characterize Jerry Brown uh, in, in California as saying, well, I think I'm going to going to wor work on, uh, on, on uh, the problem of poverty today, or maybe I'll fly to Africa. It's that spirit, <laughs> that spirit of any, I could do anything. The, 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 the Germans talk about America with some contempt, I think, as the land of unlimited possibilities. And I think the, the, the I mean, one of the, whatever Simone Weil means by necessity, I think it, it is characterized by a sort of fear of the land of unlimited possibilities. And, and that is as a kind of terror. I remember watching uh, uh, a movie of, um, about adultery, actually, with a bunch of very liberated, uh, very hip German kids once. And they looked out, they w were watching it, and it was an American movie. And, I, and as, as the guy was being unfaithful to his, his wife, I said, well, you know, it is the, the land of, of unlimited possibilities. And, they, and these very, very free-thinking Germans got immediately very tight. The sense was, yes, that's what's wrong. <laughs> that's the problem. Uh, this terror of unlimited possibility. Uh, and I think about it, I'm, I'm just going to begin teaching, um, you know, kids again, that is, college students again, people who, if anybody has a sense of unlimited possibility, it's college students. And getting back in, after having teach, taught people who are sort of in the middle of necessities in their lives, uh, you know, they have family, they have jobs, they, they have commitments of all different sorts, and it's it, it's gotten me kind of thinking about about this 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 poss this this kind of terror of possibility and the strange thing that happens when you're facing I can do anything. Hmm. Well, the place where I pull that together with what Tom was saying, um, to to call it by the name of the necessity that impinges on me, it's what can I do being who I am and coming to the realization that there are many things that are really taken for granted in our culture uh, or in my life or my work that I have to say, I can't do that because that's not who I am. And who I am is a very primary necessity and it's taken me all these years to even begin to say, you know, with some authority, this is what I do because of who I am. And this is what I can't do, I'm sorry. A lot of them are contractual obligations, unfortunately. <laughs> you mean the things you discover you can't do I because can't of do that. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, I, a popular opinion. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm actually uh, uh, doubly grateful I managed to snare you for today. I, I expected exactly that response, actually, when I asked you to come today. Uh, but I was hoping I wouldn't get it and figured I could... <laughs> I can't I could, do that. Uh, that's no, the, not <laughs> that's not me. Well, I mean, here's the problem. Uh, for, I mean, I, 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 how... I want to ask, I want to ask, how do you discover who you are? But, of course, that's... Well, I may just ask that one anyway. But if that one bugs you too much as a question, then there's, there's, a, there's an easier question, which is, what was it like... What's it like to discover a little piece of who you are. I mean, I mean, because I think a lot of people have that as the problem. I don't know who I am. Well, I, I, quiet time, I do want to speak to this, excuse me. <laughs> I think, no, you go right ahead and That's read. Right. Um, I, I think that the first thing you have to do is pay attention to the question. And the fact is that most of us don't pay attention to the question. You need to get up every morning for a very long time and say, who am I and what am I doing here? And instead, what culture pressures us to do is to say, what do they want from me? What must I do to earn my living? What does my family want? That is to say that a lot of the forces of our culture 
give us a very handy um, generic yellow and black identity that we take on for I think 50 years you know I think it's a very long process this coming to realize first of all that we're encased in an identity that is not us and then to begin to ask ourselves how we break out of that it's a very important question it's what makes us unhappy I, and for, for trying to pay attention to what you're saying and thinking about my own impatience with that question, I'm sorry, I have I was been. Rude. <laughs> no, you weren't. No, you weren't. But I'm paying attention to that, to what you're saying, and that makes a lot of sense. I put my book away and began to pay attention. I was kind of wanted to read from my little book here, um, <clears throat> and the, and I find myself with a remarkable kind of impatience to get on with it. I'm two years into this process, and I don't feel that I've got a whole lot better focus on the sort of way that I want to live in a society. I have all kinds of questions pulling at me, and I don't feel like I have dug into them enough. So you know, things that I look at, uh, um, <clears throat> I, have a, I think I have a nurturing need. And I find myself drawn to programs, education experiences that people go through. I'm thinking about a model for them as the sort of uh, uh, projects that various parishes and schools set up to give their people a new experience of a different culture, that kind of thing. And I find myself really drawn to that. I have a need also, and I'm paying attention to it because it keeps coming back of doing something with my hands. I want wow. to build something. Hmm. Now, I don't need to build something very big, but if your audience needs a deck built <laughs> and need a, man need, to, a need a man to help out to run to the hardware store and do that sort of thing, fine. I am spending, not during the summer, but during the year, I'm spending a day a week with Habitat for Humanity. I know nothing about that stuff. Everything I did week after week was for the first time. I told people early on, I know nothing about this. I am learning, and you're going to have to show me what to do. And so they were very happy to do that. Um, <clears throat> so I'm thinking about that also. Those are two areas of my life that I think I feel some sort of necessity, Simone's word, some sort of necessity to explore more fully. I've always been fascinated with pottery, and I have taken some uh, aborted attempts at learning po uh, how to do pottery. And I have that kind of need also to explore that fully and either set it aside for the rest of my days or get more involved in it. So those are kind of areas that I'm exploring, and I think I keep hearing that, that uh, voice over and over again to say, have you thought about pushing vocation in this direction or in this direction? This, I want to say this is both a wonderful and a kind of wimpy uh, picture of vocation, given the, uh, I, I mean, we have this image of vocation which has as the central case, I think, uh, the call to Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, <laughs> and I think that the the, the, the general <laughs> the general thought thinking out there in the world is that, for instance, the the call to the priesthood, for example, is a yet more extreme <laughs> kind of instance on the in the general order of the call to uh, of uh, uh, to Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, and. Uh, well, all this bit about the leash of longing is quite a different picture. That's all I've got yeah. to say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's, I mean, this whole business of, of vocation and necessity and desire, mm -hmm. uh, I, I suppose it comes naturally to Irish Catholics to use that language, right? I mean, it, it, to start thinking about what is my vocation, do I have a vocation, I mean, is that right? I mean, that, that, that language is, 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 that question is, is set from early on? It's certainly a good base to, to start the discussion on or to continue the discussion. Vocation, to, for me, was very limited. It was to marriage, to single life, to 
clerical religious life. That was originally it. When William Everson expanded that word or deepened it or maybe narrowed it even to say there's something even more core than than the church. I'm wondering if, if we might start with that. You're very kind to allow me to read from a book. I didn't, um, I hesitate to do it because I've liked the conversation, but when I retired, uh, two different people mentioned the book in the Ever After. It's fairy tales in the second half of life. And they're fairy tales about older people, people, my peers of mine. Uh, descriptive of um, these fairy tales are descriptive of the kinds of life changes that older people either go through or, watching the word carefully, ought to go through. Mm -hmm. Issues that we ought to face. And I'd like to read one in particular. It's a short one. It's from Japan. And it, it's the return of an older people to the sense of wonder. And I'd like to read it. It's short, okay? Okay. But I'll read quick. No, Without no, reading too take, quickly. Take your time. Right. Philosophy has been dealing with the same questions for 2,300 years. It's the only discipline in the world where we say we have time. Okay. okay. Very good. <laughs> Once upon their, a time, there lived a kind old man and woman who were very poor. On one New Year's Eve, they found they had no money to buy rice cakes for the holiday. Then they remembered seven straw hats the old man had made some time before. I shall go to the village to sell them, the old man said. So his wife put one of the hats on his head and the other six on his shoulders, and off he went in the snow. All that day the old man tried peddling his straw hats in the winter time, but no one bought any, so late in the afternoon he trudged up the snowy trail back to his house wrapped in misery. On his way, he noticed six statues of God standing in the snow. They were the guardian deities of children, and they looked so cold and lonely that the old man paused. I cannot leave you to shiver here, he exclaimed. And so he gave each statue a straw hat, tying them carefully on the gods' heads. Then the old man returned home. The old woman sighed when her husband told her he had no rice cakes, but she smiled when he described giving his hats to the six statues. Imagine how happy they must be, she exclaimed. And later that night, after a meager New Year's Eve dinner, the old man and his wife went to bed. At midnight, they were awakened by strange noises outside their house. Who could that be? The old man exclaimed. They listened and made out the sound of people singing. At that moment, the door flew open and a bag landed in the middle of their hut. It fell open, revealing the prettiest rice cakes the old man and his wife had ever seen, smelling sweet and fresh. And when they looked through their door, they saw the six statues, each with a straw hat bowing a New Year's greeting to them. Return of the sense of wonder and storytelling and is one of the messages of this book that is a very good one. It's a message that has resonated very strongly with me. That, that resonates real strongly with me too. And I mean, thinking about my own parents and the difference between how they struck me when we were growing up, not literally, I mean, they didn't really, <laughs> but uh, it, the, the kind of how I, how I always, the, the, the sense I had of, of, of them as, as very worried, and, 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 uh -huh. and, and the sense I have now. Um, what I am aware of is what old people talk about, older people talk about. I have uh, taken this summer to try to do something about playing golf a little bit more successfully, effectively. And so I have an arrangement where I can play free by doing a little volunteer work at this golf course. And what that opens up is an opportunity to play with some retired friends of mine, um, people whom I have known over the years and then others whom I am just meeting and getting to know a little bit better. And I'm always interested in what we talk about. Yesterday, trudging down a fairway, and it was a 
terribly hot day. This fellow and I were talking about political rhetoric and how the rhetoric needs to touch us differently from what it does. I mean, to have a president candidate come to town and talk about vouchers and education and the whole atmosphere is so poisoned by cynicism, my own and this fellow's and I think generally the population, that we don't give it any credence. And so here comes a huge expense of money and a very fine man coming here and talking to us about issues that are crucially important, but doing it in a way that I get a sense he doesn't believe us and we don't believe him and he seems to have a need to manipulate us into saying, well, he could be a bad, he might be a pretty good candidate after all. He's got some ideas, some plans, none of which are ever brought down to, as this fellow said yesterday, to the bottom line, which isn't only economics, but how is it going to involve me in improving the education system of our country? How will that involve me? This guy's 70 years old, probably. No, 67-year-old guy, same age as I. How's he going to involve me? What do I have to do here? So it's the whole rhetoric of a society, the rhetoric of our church, and the way our church has of resolving issues among us um, is crucial to me as well. I, I guess, uh, I mean, there's, I, I've, I've done, worked with old people some, you know, pretty old people, you know, lots older than you. I mean, you know, real old people, 80, 85. And uh, f had some wonderful times with them, but also I have a certain fear. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a residual fear of getting old, despite having met some wonderful people. Uh, and this, it, it, it is very hard to keep the sense of that as being a new adventure at my age. It's, it's very hard to keep it, it, it from seeming like a holding action against, you know, seeing life as a holding action against decay and measuring 50, 60, 70 as small defeats along the way. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's hard, it's hard to keep hold of any of the possibility of those conversations 30 years hence as being things I wouldn't possibly be up to now, but someday. Although, I mean, it's also something I, I, I think. I mean, it's something I, I'm willing to entertain. I, I, I'm not a fetishist about youth. Goodness knows if I'm going to accomplish anything, it will be in my 80s, given the, the trajectory I have so far. <laughs> you know, I have no hope of accomplishment before late 70s, early 80s. That's it's the only way the curve can be read is going up in terms of 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 a certain sort of progress, but uh, uh, can, I, can I react? To yeah, that you should go ahead. What, what about old age? I had breakfast with a fellow this morning, and he left, and I had a little time by myself, so I was kind of doodling and looking at um, a journal book and so on. There were three women in a booth across the way, and I had noticed them. I suppose they're mid seventies or so. They got laughing at something and they could not stop. And I just thought, if that is what's waiting for me 10 years down the line, <laughs> to be sitting there having a cup of coffee and breakfast with a couple of friends and laughing uncontrollably. I mean, this poor woman started leaving and then she went back <laughs> because she was unable to make it across the, the um, restaurant to, the, um, to pay her bill. She went back, and I found it to be so attractive and so fun. And to think, you know, there's a, just a little piece of their lives, no doubt. And I hope it reflects all through what they are doing today. That would just be wonderful. People could do that. I could just mention an experience. Uh, last evening, I was up at my cabin, and... Um, up on the St. Croix in, in Wild River State Park. And I was driving home, 
and it was foggy. It had rained, as you know, off and on all day long. And I was driving home, and the fog on 35W was heavy enough to be a factor in my mood. And I realized, again, how melancholic I become as summer starts to peter out and fall starts to show its signs. Um, driving into the cabin yesterday, I saw a number of leaves had pretty well turned. And I look out on the front porch where the flowers are that I carefully tended all summer, and now I said to myself this morning, gee, they got to water those flowers. I'm oh, nuts. They'll take care of themselves. You know, you... You see them drying up a bit, and I lose a little bit of the love affair with them and the, the care of it. But I, as I think about that, that driving in and, and driving through the fog, I began to get a sense then of what Labor Day is like and the melancholic, melancholy and the sadness that comes with it. So that I'm aware that it affects me very deeply. I don't know what all that means, but I'm aware that it does. Yeah. <coughs> I remember a story you, since I think you told it in public, I guess it's fair to mention, about going to the fair on the very last night at like 8 o'clock. And I mean, it just affected me so much, that sense oh. of, uh, of the des you know, sort of the desperate clinging to, to, to summer, which is something Sure. I certainly feel, and I, 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 it, 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 I guess that's all. It's been my prime symbol for, for my mood at the, in, in, in fall. I, I remember it very intensely. I was up at the cabin and driving home from there, often alone. I drive through the little town of Center City, and see all these homes, and they're so nicely decorated and repainted and all. And uh, the lights are on in those houses, and it looks very domestic, and I am driving. And I remember coming home that night. I, in fact, I thought about that when we discussed the topic. And um, um, I got home and cleaned up and went out to the fair. I must have gotten out there about 8.30. In fact, I was so late that they were, you could get in free. And I walked at fairgrounds for a couple hours. And uh, we can talk about what that means, I think. I'm, um, but as you mentioned the topic, those are some of the memories that I get. <clears throat> Mary Rose, does, does fall get you too? <laughs> Peter, not to blow your show or anything, but fall is a very up time for me, I have to say. Well, I was hoping, <laughs> hoping it, was up, it doesn't blow it at all. <laughs> I think maybe school teachers are on a little bit different uh, metabolism because, of course, in the fall we have to really get revved up to go back to, to our um, motivating roles. So we have to. If we, if we don't feel it, we have to pull it out of somewhere. But I think for me, actually, I, uh, I really enjoy the energy of autumn and the, um, the, the chance to engage again and to be with people. School teachers again kind of fade out into the summer and wander in our gardens. And uh, suddenly being back among people is very exciting for me. I enjoy that. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I like that. How does the transition to the motivator role feel? Oh, dear. Oh, dear. The older I get, the worse, I must say. Um, that's a hard one. I, I will admit that's a difficult transition. Sort of, well, English teachers are like cheerleaders for life. I mean, coaches, we say. No, yes. that's the contemporary metaphor for teaching English is coaching. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Got a bunch of raw recruits uh -huh. in. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. I have shelved my pom-poms and my cheerleader role for the moment. I'd give anything to see that <laughs> just once. <laughs> it's too late. Oh, wow. Mm. It's too late. Well, I mean, you guys all know know the dangers of of trying to be encouraging. I mean, you've I've, you've heard too many encouraging speeches, I'm sure, from too many people about uh, the the sournesses of life, and and yet you you got stuck it. You've gotten into positions where somehow or other people are going to expect you to 
to provide encouragement. I mean, if you're not down in fall, there are a lot of people who are. And, you know, as one hangs out a shingle and says, spiritual director, or one lets it be known that one was once a pastor, uh, this people are going to come and they're going to say, you know, I don't want Prozac. I don't think <laughs> Prozac's quite the answer. Uh, at least I'd like to try something else first, or I already tried it and it wasn't. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, help! And, and immediately, I suppose, thousands of things that you don't want to say come to, your <laughs> come to mind as things we could say. Yeah. How, how, how do you help people who's, who's, where st when stuff starts to go sour? I'd like to talk about uh, not something that I might have said to somebody, but something that um, a person whom I look on as my spiritual director said to me very recently, just a few weeks ago. And it was an extremely comforting exchange, mostly because it was not motivating and it was not <laughs> coaching. It was admitting that things can just get to a very dark place. And he said, now try this out for, um, you know, happy newspaper advice. It, it simply was not. He said, well, the second part of life has a lot to do with diminishment and loss. And instead of success and acclaim, you have to start thinking about taking a position of humility and looking for opportunities to mentor other people and to stay on the sidelines and to, to be a kind of quiet helper uh, and to sort of find a way to deal with the sense of loss rather than the next possibility, the next success, the next wonderful thing that's going to happen to you. And I came away from that interview just feeling so comforted because he hadn't said, oh, cheer up, you know, things will only get better. There's all kinds of wonderful things in old age that we can all look forward to. And indeed, I'm sure there are. But what I particularly appreciated was that resonance with, with a reality that... Um, the second part of life has more to do with a sense of diminishment um, and learning to love a diminished thing. I'm using a phrase of Carol Bly's in, in her wonderful new book, uh, Changing the Bully That Rules the World, a wonderful new book that I'm reading of hers. Um, learning to love a diminished thing has um, an exquisite kind of beauty to it. Um, if we can love a diminished thing, um, a person, a relationship, a house, a job, I think we learn to love ourselves in a way that we haven't tried out before. And that can be one of the very great pleasures of this time of life. So it's a comforting autumn, that. No yeah. lies in that. Yeah. Yeah, may I respond to that? Yeah. Please. Um, I like what, what I hear about the diminished thing, except that then I realize that I am the diminished thing. And um, I resist being thought of that way. I resist thinking about it that way. I might well not be very attached to reality when I say that. But um, <clears throat> I, I think the uh, I've had a little more experience with old age than Mary Rose has. But I've um, I don't feel so diminished. I feel diminished in some of my responsibilities. And I think some of the built-in um, rewards of carrying out the responsibilities, however poorly or well I carry them out, uh, not having the people around and so on to give me the feedback that is so useful. But I don't get a sense of diminishment so much as to search around and find the new strengths the different strengths, like time, having nothing but time. And I think uh, perhaps a little bit more um, suppressed ego, if that's in fact what we do with egos, um, recognizing that I, any mountains that I've tried to climb, I've tried that already, and I won't be doing much of that anymore. Um, and realizing I don't need a whole lot of that kind of feedback and that kind of accomplishment. But in any case, well, I guess I'm babbling a little bit, but I'm thinking about um, if Carol By had come up with a different phrase than the diminished thing, I would have been able to listen a little bit more. 
generously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I when, think she's <coughs> quoting Robert Frost. Yeah. Didn't, didn't we begin with that notion? Right, yeah. right. The, the, the oven bird, the, that light summer poem, which I can actually quote a few lines of. I was of. hoping you would. Uh, yeah. He's talking about running into this cawing, awful bird. I think it doesn't sound very good. And the, line, the lines I like are, uh, this bird would cease and be as other birds, but that it knows in singing not to sing. The question that it frames in all but words is what to make of a diminished thing. And it's talking about the end of summer and the, the leaves being tattered. And Actually, not the end of summer, the end of spring. Uh, it's the transition uh -huh. to summer that bugs frost, <laughs> and the sense of the leaves oh, not having that that first green. Uh, uh, and and uh, anyhow, uh, what to make of a diminished thing? You know, Peter, I um, get I get a sense also of the value of staying as close as possible to nature, also, and to try to be in some sort of relationship with the phases of nature. Um, as much as I feel the way I mentioned, I feel around Labor Day and the days after, when, you, when I start feeling the pickup that cool nights and cooler days, I think also it's how we connect up with people. I know in parish life to say, here we go again. We're on this roller coaster ride again. And then to realize who all the folks are that are on it with us. I find that to be extremely comforting also. And I feel um, the diminishment of summer uh, moving into the spirit of fall to be uh, you know, a pretty, um, pretty heady experiences. <coughs> May I agree? May I agree you with may Tom? I, I, like. I, well, at, at, at some brevity, I hope. Um, the notion of diminishment, while clearly it has a negative cast, what I think about when I use that word is something that's perhaps the opposite of infatuation. That is to say, there's a phase in your life where you're infatuated and passionate and involved and seeing only the bright aura of whatever it is you love, be it your job or your partner or your dog, okay? And then the opposite of that is really, it's either an extremely hostile, nasty sensation in which you leave the relationship or leave the job or leave the dog, which I almost did the other day when my dog ate a whole cake, having learned to open the refrigerator, I almost abandoned my dog. But at a more mature response, let's say, it's perhaps possible to see what this creature is, this job or this being that's uh, in our life, and to love it without that aura of our own projections and our own needs and our own definitions of what it is to accept it in a kind of in-breath of surrender to what the job really is or the dog or... And that is what I mean by the calm of the diminished life, the life I'm free of that projection of your own ego onto the external world. And that can be a time of, of abiding peacefulness, I think, especially as your dog gets older. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> There's, there's an, a feeling um, that has been kind of touched on here, a sense that's been kind of touched on here, which I wanted to bring sort of to the center, and it's the, the here it goes again feeling. I, I once had the privilege of interviewing a really fine salesman, uh, you know, $300,000 a year selling industrial shelving uh, kind of salesman. He's since moved on to much, much greater things. but. Um, he was talking about the sales cycle, uh, which goes over a period of years. And you start, you, you, you've got a decent relationship with a customer, and then somebody comes in and 
young eager beaver comes in and underbids you and for a while the relationship holds and then the person begins getting comparative bids and the, per, your customer realizes you've been a little high and this relationship sours and then the new eager beaver can't sustain the old pricing and so uh, gradually his relationship sours and this thing happens in sales over and over again on a predictable cycle every so many years and if you've seen the wheel come round and round and round enough times the whole thing just gets very tiresome and sort of sad and now I think that's a particularly sad cycle but uh, I think in life, parish life, teaching, when you get to a certain age, that line, here we go again, comes into your right ear. Uh, in marriage, surely it does. Oh boy, now we're going to do that one again. <laughs> Let's see, will this be a three-day one or a three-month one? Uh, with kids, well, not so much with kids because they kind of change, but um, there's so many of these things where you begin to say, okay, now he, here's about the time where he says that line, and sure enough, out of his <laughs> mouth comes that line. Um, curious about and in, in the fall when things begin again and they begin the way they began last fall and, and, and one knows you know a little bit of where they're going uh, having seen them begin enough times uh, I'm wondering how that strikes you that here we go again well I um, I think about it constantly uh, I thought about it constantly in parish life the here we go again um, it was always a kind of an upsmanship or an upspersonship that would take place um, depending on who the finance committee chair was each year uh, as to how early he or she would want to start the budget for the coming year. And you could never quite predict when it was going to happen, but you knew it was going to happen. And so this person would say, well, I think we ought to get started on that budget. And I would say... I cannot stand this for one more year. I have gone through it too many times. It isn't my favorite activity, although I think it's terribly important. And I am tired of those speeches, and they are tired of mine. And, um, and yet you start getting into it, and there are some fresh faces involved and fresh ideas, and that usually makes it go is the kind of newness that one uncovers, the new programs. The, um, I remember one finance committee chairperson at um, Cabrini saying to committees, let's see some imagination this year. Let's start shooting for the skies, he said. Um, tired old programs will get funded, but we need something more. And so I think it's the people who also do that, the freshness that people find as they get together and the dynamics begin among them. Well, teaching, like doing the dishes, has a lot of repetitive behavior to it. And I think exactly as Tom is saying, it's the fact that this 18-year-old freshman has never been an 18-year-old freshman before, although you have seen 25 years of 18-year-old freshmen that keeps you remembering, um, I think, to be present, to not be in last year's freshman or 20 years ago or wishing you were back on vacation, you know, just being there, showing up, being with that person in that situation. And there's a very um, calming side to a repetitive activity that I think is, is real important to me as a teacher or a dishwasher. <laughs> You know, that that is true. The repetition is significant. I I used to get impatient with it, however, um, but I think you're right. The we haven't had this person as the chairperson before, and we haven't had these committee people before, and we haven't had the imagination of folks. Um, 
getting expressed quite like this before. And so there is a good deal of newness to it, even though the old process goes over and over again. Still, it does get tiring. And um, <clears throat> one needs to move on from that, which I have done. So. <laughs> Um, as though you're, you're talking about something very liturgical in a way, a very liturgical rhythm. And it recalls for me that I used to very much enjoy the rhythms of the old church in the sense of you had a period that was a downtime and a period that was an uptime. You had Lent, you had Easter, you had Christmas, and you had that return every year. And you always sort of tried to acclimate yourself to that rhythm rhythmic cycle mm -hmm. rather than trying to pull the cycle into your world mm -hmm. do you know what i mean to get on to that cycle yeah huh? which was a wonderful discipline and a wonderful yeah. almost kind of a a mantra that you went through on a yearly basis or a, a labyrinth that you walked and you could remember how you were 20 years ago but the liturgy was still the same and you're new and the liturgy mm -hmm. is is yet again repeated in that very um orderly way that again you rise to and I think the difficulty of um, you know our modern love of spontaneity and TV and everything new and everything different and a whole new season is that it's a very scattering effect for our little minds you know mm -hmm. I mean we can only deal with so much spontaneity without that without something to hold us in in groundedness mm -hmm. and the liturgy used to do that well, better than it might do now. Well, I think it maybe does better than it ever has, at least in communities where there is a good deal of thought that is given to it, not just for the coming Sunday, but to the whole season and the relationship of seasons. Um, Jessica Powers, the poet, has uh, a phrase in which she talks about nature and nature's liturgy that nature has a liturgy also, a kind of seasonal experience of the reality of God that nature goes through. And I think that is true. I, I notice um, you just see it in subtle decorations in church, at our church, for instance, Peter. Uh, the changes that take place in fall, what kind of flowers come out. and. Uh, the simplicity and yet the beauty of what is done there um, puts one into the spirit of the season. And the season is not only fall, but the season is these last days of the ordinary time heading toward November. And the, the splendid feast days of November, all saints and all souls, and Thanksgiving and an Advent beginning. And the cycle starts over again. Um, I think that's that's right. Those, that's uh, to get into that season rather than to try to own it. Mm -hmm. Try to get into the sea. Yeah. So.